Welcome to a brand new series where we turn our attention to the very small to help understand how our universe works at this very small scale. In order to start this journey, we must understand how we came up with the concept of the atom and how this concept has evolved to the model that we use today. We will then examine some of the major problems with our current models, and this will lead on an exploration of the structured atomic model to help explain many concepts that we take for granted. But let's rewind and understand how this all started. The concept of the atom has been around for a very long time. Originally, it was conceived as a thought experiment by the philosopher Democritus. He proposed that if you were to take a copper cup and keep tearing it in half, there would come a point at which you would no longer be able to split the copper into anything smaller. He envisaged that all matter was made up of these indivisible units he called atoms. These were the building blocks from which all matter would be created. He never defined what these atoms were, nor what held them together. And this concept would lie dormant for over 2000 years. In the early 1800s, a chemist by the name of Dalton came up with a revolutionary concept. He was interested in how only like atoms in a mixture of gas repel one another, whereas unlike atoms appear to react indifferently towards each other. This concept would explain why each gas in a mixture behaves independently. Although this concept was later shown to be incorrect, it proved valuable in showing atomists like Democritus that atoms of a similar kind of matter are alike. Dalton claimed that atoms of different elements vary in size and mass. And this was counter to the accepted idea of atomists, as this would require many different fundamental particles, which would destroy the simplicity of nature. Dalton continued undeterred and focused on determining the relative masses of each different kind of atom by considering the number of atoms of each element present in different chemical compounds. His research enabled him to measure the masses of various elements, like hydrogen, oxygen, carbon and nitrogen, according to the way that they combined with fixed masses of each other. He discovered that when they reacted, they would do so in fixed proportions. Different compounds were formed by combining different atomic building blocks of different masses. The only way to explain his results was by this concept that different elements had different masses. Dalton was therefore the first to propose that different elements were composed of atoms that were different in terms of their size and mass. He collected the first evidence that underpinned this assumption. In a nutshell, his model was that each element was composed of an atom of a different type, size and mass. The model could not account for how some of these atoms joined together to form the compounds, nor what the atom itself was made of. This would require later scientists to uncover these missing elements. It would take nearly a hundred years for someone to build upon the work of Dalton. And it was Sir J.J. Thompson who in 1897 discovered the existence of the electron. He realised that these electrons were coming from the atom in his experiment. He therefore proposed that the electrons must be part of the atom itself. The problem was that they knew that the atom itself had no overall net charge. Thomson therefore proposed that the atom must contain an equal number of positive charges. He considered a number of options. Ironically, one of the models he considered was that negatively charged electrons orbit a central region of positive charge. In the end, he settled for the idea that the negative electrons occupied a region of space that was uniformly positively charged. From this, the plum pudding model was born, where the electrons sit in a soup of positive charge. Less than seven years after Dalton's work, his model would be abandoned due to the discoveries made by the New Zealand-born physicist Ernest Rutherford. He had conducted a series of experiments in conjunction with Hans Geiger. He pointed a thin beam of alpha particles, and these are essentially a helium nucleus without the electrons, so they have a positive charge, at a thin piece of gold foil. They were then able to detect where these alpha particles ended up. They were able to move the detector around the gold foil and count the number of particles detected in all directions. In his experiment, he discovered that the majority of the alpha particles passed through the tin foil. This implied that the nucleus must be mostly empty space. 
Some alpha particles were scattered at large angles, and some seemed to bounce straight back towards the source, and this implied that a great force was required to halt and deflect the heavy alpha particles. This required a relatively heavy particle with a positive charge. Putting these two findings together, it became obvious that the nucleus must be very small and contain only positive charge, meaning that the electrons must be located further from the nucleus. From this, the concept of the electron orbiting the nucleus was born. The problem was that he couldn't account for why the electrons would not instantly fall in towards the nucleus. James Chadwick studied with Ernest Rutherford. Together, they had postulated about the existence of a neutral particle that had a mass within the nucleus, the neutron. But so far, no one was able to detect it. Up until this point, there had been speculation that both protons and electrons existed in the nucleus. This is a concept that we will come full circle to. Using Geiger's latest radioactive meter, James set about repeating another scientist's experiment that had produced an unusual type of radiation. He saw this as evidence of the existence of the neutron. He continued to perform experiments which slowly built up the evidence for the existence of a neutral particle within the nucleus. Very soon after Rutherford published this model of the atom, Niels Bohr refined this model. He was a Danish-born physicist who was a student of Rutherford. It was the first model to incorporate quantum theory. It refined the concept of where the electrons were allowed to exist by creating a number of allowed orbits and limiting those to a certain number of electrons. Electrons would only jump between allowed states when they absorbed or emitted radiation. Much of the evidence for this came from the work he had performed examining the spectral lines of hydrogen and other gases. The light radiated from hydrogen atoms only occurred when an electron made a transition from an outer orbit to one closer to the nucleus. The energy lost by the electron in the transition is exactly the same as the energy of the quantum of light emitted. And this, to a large extent, is the model that gets taught at school in the early years, and for most cases works well to describe what is going on. It was, however, not able to explain why the constantly moving electrons don't emit energy and collapse into the nucleus, and did not work well for heavy elements in the periodic table. So in 1926, the Austrian physicist Erwin Schrödinger took the Bohr model one step further. He realised that using his concept of uncertainty, it would be possible to create a mathematical equation to determine the likelihood of an electron existing at a certain location. This now removed the need for the electrons to orbit the nucleus, and instead created a cloud where the probability of existing was highest. It didn't make any predictions about why the electrons remain in their location, but removed the need to consider an individual electron path. This model is still considered the best model that we have to date, but it is important to realise that there are some fundamental problems with the model. In part two, we will examine the limitations of the current model and how the physicists have defined the inner workings of the atom with little or no regard to the chemists and then how this has led to a fracturing of our understanding. If you enjoyed this video, I would really appreciate it if you left a like. If you are new to this channel, then welcome, please consider subscribing. And once again, a big thank you to all my Patreon supporters. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.